Good? Awesome. All right, uh, thanks for coming out today to a new ISF. Um, my talk uh, today, uh, the topic, oh, get rid of that. The topic is uh, InfraSec uses hardening, it's super effective. Um, the goal is to uh, teach the common sense side, practical sides of uh, hardening. Um, I will also provide uh, some IRL examples uh, that I've seen best in the corporate environments. Uh, I'll also try to limit the amount of dick jokes as possible, but uh, since my topic's about system hardening, I uh, might have a little difficulty with that and I'm already failing. So as everyone does research, the first thing they do is uh, go to Wikipedia. So I'm gonna just gonna read it out loud the Wikipedia uh, article first before I go into my own thing. So in computing, hardening is, a, or is usually the process of securing a system by reducing its surface of vulnerability. A good definition. A system has a larger vulnerability surface the more functions it fulfills. In principle, a single a function system is more secure than a multi-purpose one. Common sense, but yeah. <coughs> Reducing the available vectors of attack typically includes the removal of unnecessary software, unnecessary usernames, or logons, uh, disabling and removing unnecessary services. And that's actually the first paragraph. Sorry. <laughs> Bore you some more with some more copy-paste Wikipedia. There are various methods of uh, hardening Unix and Linux systems. This may involve, among such other mother measures, as applying custom kernel patches, such as XShield and PAX, uh, <coughs> closing network ports, setting up an IDS, firewall, or IPS. Uh, that, that's kind of vague, because when you're talking about system hardening, you're talking about a system that's more infrastructure hardening. Um, but if you're installing an IDS, I still don't think that's considered hardening because you're installing additional software on your uh, server. It's like saying I installed an antivirus software and I made it more secure. Well, technically you installed a piece of software that you're, uh, may have additional attack vectors. And in the past, it's actually been used uh, as leverage since uh, the antiviruses generally are part of the root. So you could actually um, attack the antivirus and get full root access and it has happened before. Um, Besides that definition, carrying on. There are also hardening scripts such as Linus, Bastel, Linux, JAS, Solaris System uh, have their own, or it's called JAS. Uh, Apache and PHP hardening uh, scripts that pretty much go through. A lot of these automated tools just go through, see, hey, what's configured, what's enabled. Uh, you can't exactly know what your system's going to be using or not through like a lot of these automated scripts. Uh, I'm not really going to talk about that stuff, though. More of a consensual base after this. So, too long, didn't read. Hardening equals reducing your surface of attack. There you go, simple as it is. So, I'm gonna break down the concept of uh, hardening into uh, three different categories. The next slide will be a bar graph uh, representing each. So, on the left, you have time spent drinking, followed by uh, your three different types of uh, methods represented by items in a, you find in a bar, a bar graph. Um, so you got use the best uh, configuration practices, remove unneeded software, and limit your scope. Uh, going by how much time you're going to be drinking to fix your server. So starting with uh, best configuration practices. Um, so who's worked at an environment that uh, you spin up a server, you update some Windows, and you're good type of thing? Who's done that before, worked somewhere that you're like, really, that's all you guys do is Windows patching? Okay, um, so uh, who in your environment ran the Windows update for the Poodle vulnerability? Who has done that? Come on, raise your hands. Oh, uh, you guys are good because there's no Windows update for that. Um, <laughs> I was hoping to trick somebody. Damn, uh, or darn. darn. Uh, so um, when you... <laughs> <laughs> when, when, <laughs> I'm keeping it up. I'm going to talk about this for a good about 20 minutes, and then I'll carry on to the next slide. I don't have to look. You guys do, though. So, um, <laughs> With uh, op uh, SSL v2 and SSL3, uh, it's not really necessarily like it's old, broken, but it's still better than ciphertext, or clear text, I mean. 
So a lot of corporations will have that, and it's still need of it. But if your corporation doesn't, uh, there's fixes for it. Uh, some of the approaches are essentially, uh, um, like I saw people do group policy push down saying disable internet explorer options of SSLV and SSLV2, which is great and dandy, but uh, the, if you don't lock down the internet options from the end user, they could go in there and uncheck that. It also doesn't protect you from third party applications that are running in the system. So really the true fix to address this issue is uh, basically the approach that everyone should take when addressing an issue, the root, <coughs> the root cause. Uh, so with what I did is I, there's a registry edit, you could just push down on all of your computers through group policy or manually. And um, in there you basically disable SSL uh, v2 and SSL v3 and then you're done. So no, like even if you have like Firefox running something, and you manage to try enabling it on there, it's still gonna block that from the S channel suite. S channels for the Windows, OpenSSL for the uh, Linux and Unix. I don't know how to do it on the uh, OpenSSL, how to disable on the client level though. So, you installed SSH, you're done, you're good, right? Um, one does not simply SSH into Mordor. Uh, there's a lot of hardening practices for SSH, even though it's a very simple program, and all you're doing is essentially creating a clear, or uh, uh, encrypted uh, shell between you and your computer. Uh, first practice is disable root. You should never log on SSH in, as a root user. You basically log in as your you know, other user and uh, switch users up or run sudo if you do that. Um, reasons for many, but one of the things that people overlook is that, let's say some odd reason they magically find out one day, you know, some encryption suite is completely broken and everyone's been backdooring it for a while. Now you have your full um, SSH uh, password for root compromised. Now if you were logging as a common user, the attack vector is a lot less. Another practice in here is fail to ban. So um, that's gotta suck though if that ever did happen in real life. <laughs> um, felt, yeah, yeah, got very crappy, crappy day. Especially it looks hot out there because there's flies on the toilet if you can see that. Um, so fail to ban is kind of a brute force attempt uh, mitigation. So if somebody's constantly pegging your uh, SSH with the uh, same IP, guessing multiple times at a certain variable, it'll block the IP. Uh, fail to ban is also used in other applications too. So I'm gonna go over, this is actually copied from um, I think it was uh, Stack Overflow, some form online. It's a very good overview of it, of hardening practices. Uh, is all this necessary? No, depends on you know your corporation, what you wanna do, but everything helps. Everything is a little bit of a way to mitigate your attack vector. Don't allow root login, which I already mentioned. Don't allow SSH passwords. It's something that's actually very simple. You just do a private key, and instead of actually typing a long password, no human will probably remember a password that's more secure than a private key authentication. Your private key is gonna be a long string of characters that's not pre pretty much impossible to brute force. Don't listen on every interface. And the other one is uh, create an interface specifically for SSH. It's really kind of, in a way, it seems pointless, but I mean, it does help if you have a device that has you know 40 network adapters um, on it and every port is SHable you have you know, 40 different things you have to monitor. Uh, don't use common usernames. So let's say I'm Alex and I work at a corporation and somebody Googles my name and see I work at this corporation, they can know they could probably use my name uh, likelihood as a SSH user. So um, you know, if you're gonna do something that, do Alex-ADM for admin or something different. So that mitigates your attack. Um, use an um, allow list for users. By default, it's gonna reach into uh, PAM for your security. So all your users that are uh, logged in locally are gonna be the same types that uh, support SSH. So you can limit that too. Require, uh, or if you require, essentially uh, the next one is uh, disable as much uh, IP addresses as possible. So you could block a whole CIDR notation and saying that you're only gonna be in this ever accessing it remotely. Or you could also do, which is not mentioned in there, if you know that you're never gonna be in China and SSHing into your uh, server, do only airing IP addresses so that you have you know, North America only IP addresses. You could also uh, find a way to connect without internet access. Uh, so if you basically use an AWS server to pivot into your SSH uh, into your server, 
Use software like Fail to Ban, like I mentioned. Um, a lot of these softwares uh, help, um, I mean, you can set your rates on how the things are banned. And there's also other ones out there, I forget their names, um, but they, they also work generally in conjunction with other uh, clients. So you have like your Apache logons, stuff like that for websites. You could uh, link Fail to Ban through that too. Make sure your OS is up to date, in particular uh, security and SSA packages. Uh, so that's pretty much that. Um, not really glorified uh, hardening manuals, but they kind of are. They're just kind of a good overview, uh, like your PCI compliance, HIPAA, various other ones out there. They're, they're a good guideline to go through. I mean, PCI, for example, keep your uh, data transfers, or sorry, your network, uh, credit card transactions on a separate network. It's simple, but it's effective. Um, these, if you want to go over these things that for your company, they're always going to help out a little additional. Um, remove unneeded software. So, um, who has been the, at a corporation, you log on to, let's say, like the domain controller, and you're like, why the hell did they install World Warcraft on the server? Um, but I mean, not to that extreme, but who, who's been at a corporation where you're looking at the server and you're looking at all the installed stuff on it? Some of them are even if services facing the internet, you're like, they're, they're not using. Was that? Yeah. And you're like, why? Why? Um, so uh, I'll give you an example in a second. Um, and, and the funny thing is, too, I worked a long time ago, uh, computer repair, and I had old people like this. I'm, uh, it's annoying where they have all these toolbars. They're like, I just kept clicking and things. I'm like, don't use a computer. <laughs> so I worked at a larger company once, and one of their default images had Google Chrome on it. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, that's cool. Chrome is a little bit more secure than Internet Explorer, but why the hell are you browsing the Internet on a server? It's my first <laughs> reaction. Uh, so it's just a simple thing. I mean, you got to also update Chrome. You also got to, um, you know... You shouldn't be doing that in the first place. So um, another example is uh, I worked at another company, a data center up in Cleveland, and the guy was installing network drivers, an updated version of it, and he was going on Google on the server, just going through that, and he, I think he downloaded it from a non-manufacturer website too, and it just kind of blew my mind. I'm like, why are you doing this? Why don't you download locally first in case you randomly click that one website on the driver, you know, that gives you something weird. The other thing is, um, you know, why you know non manufactured website blew my mind, but he said he had a, a FortiGate firewall and had a built in uh, antivirus definitions in there and it was made it more secure. I'm like, yeah, it doesn't really work that way, but whatever. Um, so it's pretty straightforward. Remove unneeded software. I mean, I don't really have to go a whole lot into this, so, but if you're going to be, uh, if you're logging into a new company and uh, you're. Uh, you're in a new company and you're, uh, you see the server and some things that you realize are not needed in there. Uh, first, uh, go with un, you know, things that have open ports on it. That's the, clearly the most secure way to get rid of it. The easiest way to do that is two things. One is to monitor the network traffic, see if things are actually hitting it. If there's nothing really hitting it that you feel that you could get rid of it, get rid of it. The other thing is uh, just go in there and disable the service and see if people uh, complain about it. Um, and then if nobody complains, remove the software. Software dependencies, uh, this goes into not just server, but also like kind of a developmental life cycle. Uh, people love to install like a library source that's really big and not needed. So when you have a large uh, dependency you're pulling, you are also got a, uh, like a dependency tree which has like multiple dependencies for dependencies, dependencies. All of those software have to be patched if they have all individual vulnerabilities. So pretty much, as a nutshell, um, you know, make sure what you're doing is specifically only to the task of the server. And then uh, the next one is uh, for the topic is called limit your scope. Some serious case of dry mouth right there. There we go. That was a little weird coloring. Um, we could talk about this topic all day. This is one where you could spend a lot of time on a server. Uh, you could also spend a lot of time of, you know, in a way, conceptually of like how memory is done. And it's just a overall never ending topic if you think about it. So who at their corporations uh, used Emmet before and installed Emmet? Oh wait, sorry, wrong Emmet. Um, Enhanced Mitigation Experience Toolkit. So um, this is essentially a 
elaborated GUI that installs a bunch of registry edits for your operating system. Your operating system comes with it, Delfecto. A lot of these things, uh, they're just disabled. Uh, so you can enable all uh, applications to use uh, dead execution pre uh, prevention. Uh, your uh, structure exception handling overwrite protection, which is kind of a big fancy word for, um, in, in the programs themselves, they have stack canaries so that when you overwrite the stack, they're, um, a, a value in there that basically tells you that that's been overwritten. So if some type of attack happens in your structure and exception handling is a uh, um, method of controlling that and there is a way in Windows to bypass that and then overwrite the stack canary or stack uh, cookie value. Uh, and then your address space layout randomization. So overall, it's a good tool to just install, enable by all, like enable always on all that stuff because when you're doing that, you're, you're your attack surface shrinks a lot because a lot of uh, malware depends on uh, these not being enabled. It uh, makes things a lot harder. Um, the other thing is I, when I do this stuff, I never come across a corporation that really ever complained about these features being on or if it breaks any programs. I got this image from Trusted Sec, so, um, which has also a very good guide of installing it and setting it up. There is another thing that most people don't do when they set up the uh, uh, Emmet, which I don't do either, but um, it, when you go under apps, you can see all the processes individually. And inside there, there's a thing called um, ASR, Attack Surface Reduction. Um, it's basically a way to tell what modules this uh, program will run. So you can limit your scope. So let's say something gets popped in a flash you could tell it that it cannot go to some other uh, programs that reference other programs. So it, it reduces your surface a lot, which goes into the next topic is, uh, which is a very similar concept, uh, SE Linux. So who wants to learn SE Linux or who, who here heard of uh, SE Linux? Okay, who wants to learn in about five minutes? It's not really that complicated. I and mean, writing policies are, but um, so. Linux uses a discretionary access control, DAC. Not that type of DAC, though. Those are uh, digital analog converters. Um, first, get in your mind that everything on a Linux operating system is a file. Your memory is a file. The keyboard input you're typing in is a uh, file, too. It's a, basically a file that keeps pulling through its interrupts. Everything is a file. And each file through discretionary is broken down into three levels of access and then also the type. The type on the far left, which is represents the D, is usually either a file, a directory, or a char, char device, which it would be like, for example, if you have your um, sound card, that's going to be a char device. It's going to be a constant pull input of that. Um, these three categories are broken down to users, groups, and others. Others is essentially world, everything. Uh, users is the owner of the creator or the creator of the file, and then groups are uh, the, the groups it belongs to. Um, you have each level, read, write, and execute. So on the left, you have each one of those per, uh, groups, users, and whatever, are you know RWX or whatever you want to set for permissions. We have we've all probably done a CH mod seven seven in the past, and that basically means that you have full access to everyone on that file. Creator of the file is also the owner. That's one thing I like about creating things like this is that you start going to Google and you're finding random things that just make you laugh. And you're like, I got to put that on my slide. Which, uh, the next one's even better. This one actually made me have a good chuckle. Parents heard I was doing PHP, so they sent me to rehab for no reason. Um, so how, how does this, uh, the fact that every uh, file that's created is essentially their owner a problem? Well, um, an example is that you have a PHP website that accepts files anonymously. Um, each file is granted the owner of the service, or owner of the file. Let's say somebody uh, finds a way to exploit uh, PHP or some service on the actual server. Now, it could, instead of writing all the shell code inside the memory where it's exploited, which sometimes is a very small vector, they could reference a shell code as of a, a file that's being uploaded to the uh, server. So you could actually have a lot larger of a shell code to attack your server. So um, in 2001, uh, NSA wanted to implement uh, SE Linux onto uh, the kernel. And Torvald said, nope, you guys are going to be doing something different, though. 
So along came uh, LSM, which is uh, Linux Security Modules. It basically creates hooks, like an API, so to speak, that allows you to um, overwrite the uh, discretionary access controls. Um, so essentially, uh, you could have discretionary, which is normally in the, the operating system, and then it would also reference your mandatory access controls like SE Linux or App Armor or GR Security separately. So uh, SE Linux is policy driven. Um, at boot, the kernel references the policy rules, which you can change, though. Um, and those policy rules essentially define how um, the groups and uh, um, the different levels of access are done. I'll explain in a second. So you have this guy right here. This is the example. You have the user. His user's name is Swift. The group he belongs to is uh, user, uh, or sorry, media and video which is your discretionary, and then you also have your SE Linux context. So you have your user U, user R, user T, and all that other stuff, which I'll explain in a second. So this user is trying to access a script. Um, so each of that context, you have your SE Linux user, SE Linux role, and SE Linux type. Um, in a nutshell, it's just a big policy to basically compare that what the user belongs to, what role he has, and what type of uh, scope he could get, play with. You can create a defined rule that says which process does what, what, what uh, um, files should be in what directory, stuff like that. So in a nutshell, you could pretty much say, hey, um, my PHP server, I want to create a policy that says that this, this program that's running in the memory should never, ever touch the home directory where all the local files are stored in there. And you create a policy rule for that, and then you basically go ahead, and then when, when that, uh, you know, some odd reason your PHP server gets exploited, trying to run that stuff in the home directory, it gives it a deny, so you limit your attack from that. So that's pretty much SE Linux in a nutshell. Um, bam and shazam. So um, I would... I kind of threw this in the end. Uh, I didn't want to like way too much information at all at once. In order to understand some of the concepts of Jira security, uh, you have to understand how like the memory works. Um, and also, don't really feel like talking about like assembly and C stuff either. But um, this this type of memory, not the uh, that memory. Um, but uh, GR security is essentially, I'll just kind of give a brief overview. It incorporates uh, custom Linux patches. Uh, it's not on the vanilla kernel, so it's like, additional things that you throw on there that you have to do. Uh, well, you install the whole kernel as through GR security patches. Uh, PAX um, was the original uh, person that created a lot of these custom patches, which included uh, proper memory segmentation for your data execution prevention um, and a bunch of other things. Um, GR security helps with things like uh, CH root restrictions. It also uh, denies things in like uh, your proc directory or mmap. So if you're able to compromise something, you, you can't see what's actually in uh, what or how the memory uh, map is laid out. And uh, full system ASLR and a bunch of other things. Kind of similar to Emmet, but it, you know, different in some ways. Uh, GR security actually has a its own uh, mandatory access control, it's uh, role-based, it's uh, less priv uh, least privilege. GR security, uh, the developer of that is aware that SE Linux is a, very popular, so if you want to disable your role-based and actually use the SE Linux instead, you can do that. Um, and uh, I'll, I'll keep this shorter, but there's different concepts when you're dealing with memory. Um, I kind of threw this in because this came from a different presentation. Uh, you got stack canaries, which are basically random string characters in your memory stack. So if somebody tries to compromising your program and runs a buffer overflow in your memory, you could actually, um, if uh, one of those values is overwritten, the program sees that the canary value that was uh, kind of uh, um, that the program knows has been overwritten. You could base it will kill the execution of the program, so it'll, it'll actually stop the program from being compromised. Your no execute bit, which is essentially dep which is in Windows, so basically in your memory, you have certain parts of it that are not executable, and that's determined by the CPU. Um, I wanted to put a uh, uh, reference to uh, Star Wars since that's coming out soon. 
and uh, address space layer randomization. So your memory map of all your uh, addresses are going to be completely randomized. So the guessing game of where the programs are make things a lot more difficult for the attacker. And uh, if you want to learn um, the concept of hardening, this this distro is not really, it's not like, it's most distros, especially now, it's like pretty much like in Ubuntu or Fedora, you like click on it, throw the CD in there, install it. This is the same, this distro still takes it back in the days where it was a lot harder where you had to understand your dependencies and a bunch of other things. Um, with the benefit of this distro is you really get to understand how um, programs are run with uh, this thing called use flag. So when you actually compile your program and, or install it, um, you get the option to uh, disable certain things of that program. So going back to the example when I was talking about I went too far back. Your uh, de software dependencies. On Gen 2 you could tell, like for example, you're installing Sampa, uh, which is a um, essentially now Sampa 4 is a full active directory, so it includes DNS, Kerberos, um, a bunch of things built into it so that you got full-on support for mimicking a uh, Windows Active Directory. Before, it used to be more of just a file uh, server. Uh, so if you want just the actual um, file server part of it, where, so essentially you want to type a few backslashes and see your network share and throw files in it. Um, with the Gen 2, you can install the latest one, Sam before, and you can throw in use flags like minus Kerberos, minus DNS, so you're not installing Bind, you're not installing Kerberos, you're not installing all these other pieces of software that are uh, another, <coughs> another attack vector. And a lot of distros you don't get that support with of limiting your scope uh, that much. Uh, the other thing is that um, in Gen 2, their thing is that they want to teach you how to install the kernel, which is kind of a, more of a pain. But um, most, all, pretty much all distros now, when you boot up an operating system, it's going to load the internet. So it's going to actually pull all the modules that you need and compare it to your hardware and you're done. Um, but if you limit the, uh, or build your own kernel with specific hardware that you know of your operating system, um, that means that all those additional drivers, modules that could be loaded uh, are not um, acceptable to an attack vector. And it's not really common, but I mean, it's everything, you know, does matter in a way. Uh, and then also Gentoo is known for that ricer mentality where you're getting that like extra 1% out of it. Um, so. Uh, that's pretty much that. If you want to learn the hard ways of doing things, you know, try the Gen 2, try the hardened sources so that you could actually, um, you know, mess with that a little bit more. And their documentation is getting a lot better. The actual slides I have for the SC Linux part was actually pulled from their website. So that's me. I'm at, follow me on Twitter, Alex underscore S underscore Cot. IT at a, I work IT at a credit union. I love Wi-Fi, embedded devices, open source software. Um, I'm a uh, F fond of weird science, like I like quantum mechanics, lasers, RF, magnets. I just like know how they work, magnets. Um, and, uh, and that's a picture of me shining myself with a one watt laser. So, any questions? Um, <laughs> the short answer or the long answer? Well, essentially, magnets are. Uh, the electrons on the magnets, or the metal itself, represents, uh, you know, I'm not even going to go into that. There's actually a good, um, if you go on YouTube, Richard Feynman did a really good talk of explaining the magnets, because it's kind of hard to visualize, but it basically, the electrons and how they flow represents kind of like more of a how um, items around it represents the time of that spin of the electrons. And when you get an item closer to it, it, it kind of wants to grasp it because of that. It's kind of like gravity, but not. What, Richard Feynman? Yeah, the guy asks him why. Yeah, and then he goes and talks about, like, his grandma falling on the ice type of thing. I love people like that, where, like, you're asking a simple question. Like, I can't give you a simple answer, but I'll give you all these relevant, you know, responses to make your mind open up so you understand a little bit. Anybody else questions? To the topic, not about magnets or lasers. I can talk about lasers, too. It's an actual acronym. I don't forget what it stands for. Emissions, radiation, yep. Thank you. Fist bump on that. Science. Science. Science, Bill and I. All 
right. All right, Alex Scott, ladies and gentlemen.